Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening in to Being With, a podcast series produced by the Biennale of Sydney as part of our 23rd edition, Rivas. Before we begin, I would like to take time to acknowledge the many different countries we connect from today. I come to you from Wangar country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, waters, and skies, the Wangal of the Eora Nation and elders past, present, and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends here with us today. I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spirit, imagination, and rich history of storytelling and artistic practice that is an ongoing inspiration to me personally and our team at the Biennale of Sydney. My name is Leah Smith and I am the Curator of Programs and Learning at the Biennale of Sydney. I'm delighted to be here with you today and with Biennale participant Hannah Talicki. Hannah is a British Finnish artist, composer and performer based in Glasgow, Scotland. Her practice spans performance and audiovisual installation, blending vocal music, choreography, costume and drawing. In her work, she investigates how the body communicates beyond and before words to tell stories through imitation, vocalization and gesture. With a largely place responsive process, she considers how bodily relationships and folk histories are encoded with, within specific environments, ecologies and places. Her recent work engages with what it means to live on a damaged planet, proposing contemporary queer ritual as a way to process the trauma that comes with ecological awareness. Before we sink into conversation with Hannah, I will share a brief curatorial note on being with. Being With features local and international voices from across our exhibition program. It aims to shed light on the rich and diverse relationships we hold with nature, science and technology through facilitating a deep dive into rich and ongoing creative and conceptual practices that span art, design, environmentalism and activism. Through Being With, we aim to demystify interspecies communication and connection through moving between micro and macro environments. Ancestral and futuristic knowledge systems and cultural practices will be discussed as tools for understanding how these relationships are and furthermore can be nurtured. Being with is a beautiful reminder that amidst a global pandemic, we are never truly alone. My conversation with Hannah today will be centered on being with seals. The conversation will flow and also absorb selkie narratives and song but it's important to note that the conversation is grounded in an awareness of ancient folklore and mythology with a deep respect and acknowledgement of more than human relationships. It's my great pleasure to now hand over to Hannah. Welcome, Hannah. Would you mind? Hi. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) Would you mind introducing yourself and just sharing a little bit about where you connect with us from today? Yeah, hi. Um, So I'm Hannah and today I am sat in my studio it's my morning and your evening and I'm in Glasgow in Scotland um it's been raining this morning Mm. um and COP is just about to arrive here in Glasgow so there's um a lot of anticipation for this for Mm. this huge event here Mm. in Glasgow today interesting And so, I mean, this is a little interesting segue, but I'm curious about your childhood. So the second <laughs> question is actually, I mean, I found, yeah, when I discovered your your work, I mean, all of these um, ancient stories that sort of come and filter into your practice today are, are so fascinating to me. And I'm, I'm curious if you would mind sharing a story from your childhood with our listeners. Yeah, so um, I thought I'd share something about those sorts of entanglements that happen naturally as a child. Mine, um, my story is about entanglements of the more than human world of death and ritual. And I think this has informed who I am as a person and as an artist. So I was born in Brighton um, to a Finnish mother and an English father. And until I was 11, we lived in a, in a terraced house in the middle of town. But you wouldn't know it because um, it was a crescent 
and inside the crescent there was a three acre communal garden. So along with all the other kids I used to spend most of my time, daylight hours, playing outside, um, cycling, making dens in the bushes and up trees and um, but most significant of all perhaps was um, running in inverted commas a bird hospital and burial ground wow. so um to explain a bit further <laughs> um <laughs> a, a lot of people had cats and cats as we know hunt birds mm. so consequently every few days I'd find an injured um or dead songbird and um my mum who um, is an amateur practitioner of homeopathy, taught me how to use arnica <laughs> internally for healing um, <laughs> shock and wounds. Wow. Um, and so I um, started this little bird hospital where I had these boxes stacked on top of each other and would give um, crushed arnica tablets to these birds. Sometimes they'd um, they'd survive and um, recover wow. um, and sometimes they passed away they were too far gone so I used to bury their tiny little bodies in <laughs> um, a small uh, slope behind some trees and um, for every burial I felt quite obliged to hold a little funeral and um, which was like a childhood ritual with a with a poem, um, maybe a song, uh, maybe I'd place a little flower or a twig. Um, and this obsession probably started from when my grandmother passed away and I went to her funeral. So it sort of, um, it affected me profoundly, but I was also affected by the death of these more than human critters. Um, and I wanted to honour my feathered friends <laughs> with the same beauty that I'd witnessed for a human life. Mm. Um, so now I was reflecting on this because it, it feels like this entanglement is still very present and recurring, a recurring element in my work. You know, this this um, relationship between m more than human kinship, death and ritual and I think um, it's really feeding into my current interest of um, how we meet and process ecological grief and then practices of mourning as a way of establishing kinship with mm. more than human mm. um, critters, making connections. Yeah, I, so that's I, my I, little story <laughs> for you. I love this story and I love it because like it's the first time I've asked this question to anyone and I surely didn't know where it was going to take me but this is <laughs> such a like incredible insight I mean also you're a natural storyteller so I felt like I was just there with uh mini Hannah um how oh. old were you when you were um you know sort of facilitating these practices and I guess I'm curious as to whether they sound so performative um whether there was an audience or whether it was like a solo exercise no, it was a solo exercise, um, mm. really just these small rituals um, uh, as a way for me to process this, these um, deaths mm. um, of, of, of feathered kin. Yeah. And um, I, my grandmother passed away when I was seven and mm. I actually lived in this place between the age of seven and 11. So mm. it was around that time. Mm. um and yeah it was performative it was I, I felt like I had to honor these lives yeah. it's it feels um, like profound um respect and care like that's really what comes across um when yeah you talk about this yeah this gift I guess and acknowledgement it's so beautiful <laughs> wow mm. I love that I mean I think it's such an interesting insight even to like yeah some of the themes that you're exploring in your work today yeah um, right isn't that strange how I mean it's yeah. not strange it's just who we are often comes from those experiences in childhood and just yeah. repeat and uh, evolve absolutely yeah. but yeah maybe we don't spend so much time deeply thinking or reflecting on them to then kind of see how they um circle back you know, yeah. in, in different and, and new ways. 
Um, I guess that kind of takes us to the the next question. So I'm curious, I mean, you talk about your your work being very place responsive um, Mm -hmm. and maybe we can chat a little bit more about that. So how do you feel that place and culture inform your making and creating practice? Yeah, so I do have a place responsive process. It always begins with an inquiry around place. Mm. Um, I'm interested in connections between folk histories um that are encoded within specific places mm. with, and their ecologies their histories mm. um i often talk about this process of unearthing mnemonic topographies um the land encoded in the song the mm. law in the l o r e meaning of the word mm. embedded in the land and mm. this relationship. So mm. how can I how can I unearth mnemonic topographies of place yeah. to communicate stories of meetings and enfoldings across past, present and future nature cultures? That's like a big question for me. Mm. <laughs> and then how can how can I work with my body? So I work with um with my voice and mm. with Um, movement how Mm. can I work with my sounding body to excavate and activate the layers of these stories that are entangled within a specific place Mm. um so history um memory um folk history I'm particularly interested in Mm. um ecology really traditional or vernacular knowledges that are contained within within poetry of place dance that mm. might be related to a specific um, uh, assemblage of of more than human critters um, song. So, what are these? What are these interweavings? What are these entanglements? Mm. Yeah, I'm int- I'm curious, and I mean, I'm, I guess I'm also now wondering. As you were talking, I was thinking about like, do you think of in your own practice? I know that there's um, a strong um, like language base and and storytelling and narrative in what kind of Um, informs your making but then there's almost a process of abstraction I guess do you think in in the process of then moving into like bodily movement and sound and moving away from language or yeah I'm really interested in how the body communicates before or beyond words yeah so um in that sense yeah there's maybe it's less about abstraction but more about distilling to a kind of essence of something Mm. that is from the body that it's not um I'm not obscuring something with language and I want to try and communicate beyond those limitations yeah Um, yeah. that and it's and it becomes maybe about uh for audience about a felt connection rather than a cerebral um thinking yeah that was the other thing I was thinking that it's very physical I guess Mm -hmm. and very emotive in that way um yeah beautiful so as I mentioned I mean I've done some quite a bit of reading on your work in preparation for today but you shared um you know one particular piece of writing and thinking with me which was really lovely to kind of engage with um one statement that really stood out was when you described your current inquiry of mimesis as a practice of becoming with and I'd just love for you to maybe sort of unpack that and, and sure. delve into what that means to you. Yeah. So I guess let's start with this word mimesis. Mm. Um, so it comes from ancient Greek mm-hmm. um, and it can mean both imitation and representation. Mm. And really it has a, a long, rich history in the Western philosophy of arts. Um, it originated with the philosopher Plato, ancient Greek philosopher, who um, talked about mimesis um, as an element of the dramatic arts. Mm -hmm. Um, And he suggested that when actors impersonate characters in a play, they render themselves vulnerable to absorbing the qualities of those characters. Uh which is a really interesting idea. And so I use the term to refer to a kind of imitation within music, Mm. um, movement and dance, Mm -hmm. specifically mimesis of the more than human. So Mm. 
Mimesis of various critters, of water, of weather, of complex multi-species entanglements and assemblages. Mm. And I'm really interested in the practices of mimesis that sit outside of Western philosophy. Mm. So these kind of practices have existed throughout time in vernacular culture around the world, um, emerging often through an intimacy with um, local ecologies so through that felt connection with place um, mm. and I'm interested in what these kind of embodied knowledges um, ha- what they might teach us about living and yeah. dying yeah. Um, and of coexistence and of kinship mm. um, so just to so like my first kind of large-scale work that um, explored or engaged with this practice of mimesis was a project called Air Fall of Lesh Nihyon, which is um, the Gaelic for uh, Away with the Birds. Mm. And it was um, a body of um, multidisciplinary work which explored the mimesis, so the imitation or emulation of birds mm. in traditional Scottish Gaelic song poetry. Mm-hmm. So I was interested could this process of music making, mm. of um, singing with bird, be one of making kin? So how mm. could I extend my edges um, beyond my... Hu- how could I extend my voice beyond my human edges into mm. a space where species meet? Yeah. So at the heart of the project was a vocal composition written for a female ensemble um, that was woven together from fragments of songs and poems that are imitative of birds, that are mimetic of birds, into a kind of extended vocal tapestry of sound that sort of emerges from place. Because the project culminated in a performance um, on the Isle of Canna, which is one of the small isles in the Hebrides on the, the west coast of Scotland, Um, And the performance took place in the harbour, on the shoreline and in the water and on a skein-shaped platform in the water. And um, my intention really was to create a space for listening um, and for becoming present and for tuning into this continuum of human and more than human. Mm. And since then, I've sort of explored mimesis in various ways. I've Um, through my own kind of experimental practices and also learning from tradition bearers. Um, I've explored mimesis of river through gesture um, Mm -hmm. in a project in Fokochi Biennial. Oh, yeah. Um, I've explored mimesis of cuckoo um, uh, on the Isle of Egg, another little island in the Hebrides. And... um, more recently, I was exploring mimesis of deer through dance in a project called Deer Dancer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess I feel like I'm going on now, but I um, mimesis, you asked about this thing, uh, mimesis is a practice of becoming with. What I mean by that is that it's a practice of opening our sensory awareness to other or attuning to more than human it's a it's a meeting point or like a space in between Mm. it's a way of directing attention to Mm. earth others Mm. and it's a method of thinking with and feeling with so it's really kind of the pivotal the pivotal um heart of my Mm. of my practice yeah, it's um, it's so. I mean, you're blowing my mind at the moment because I'm like, <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm just. No, I've no, had I, coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's incredible because I mean, I had, I mean, I've not, um, I've not understood, you know, that word in such detail before, and I think imitation, you know, it's obviously, you know, somewhat removed from this idea of mimesis, but it's seen as something often less than you know like not not your own um yeah but then you know completely I mean first of all acknowledging the lineage of that word and its origins and then looking at it within like um yeah like a a theatrical kind of um position but then 
I mean, even right now I'm thinking of the word becoming and also mm. the term, um, you know, the, the title of this podcast being being with, but now I'm like that suggests greater separation than this idea yeah. of becoming with, you know, because mm. being with almost feels um, parallel, you know, like you're, you're mm. eliminating or you're reducing the gap. But this idea of being with when you talk about um, embodying the, the song, the movement, the gesture, the pattern of these more than human um, elements of nature or animal, it's, it, it facilitates a, a deeper connection and understanding with that thing because you're almost moving, we're trying to at least move beyond your humanness in some way. Yeah. I mean, just going back to that initial point you made about when we think of imitation, we think of it as less than. Mm. But actually, we learn through imitation. That's what mm. we do as babies. We're imitating the world around us. Yes. And um, so I think through imitation or mimesis, we can we learn and we can evolve something. So it's it's not about trying to make a direct copy of something. Um, mm. It's not about trying to imitate uh imitate a deer <laughs> entirely yeah. because we yeah, can't yeah. we're limited yeah. by our our form but it's about a felt connection and 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 the nurturing of empathy perhaps mm, mm. um but then even thinking about um the evolution of music and language some some people uh think that um music and language evolved through our listening to the more than human world and mm. then um, uh, imitating them. those sounds yeah. and then they evolve and then they become mm. abstracted and stylized. Mm. And um, mm. and there's always, in, in these traditions that I've been exploring over the, over the years, there's always this kind of spectrum of mimesis from something that is iconic. So, like, I don't know, like the raven. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Yeah, that's like yeah. an iconic... Um, imitation of Raven, but mm. then there's 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 more stylized um, forms where the melodies of of mm. different species might ghost through the human melody mm. rather than kind of being directly imitative. Yes. Um. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so enthusiastic about this. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I mean, it's um, it's such a whole new world for me to kind of like grab grapple you know my head around but um mm. but it's yeah I mean I think it's also just a really beautiful practice to kind of think of and sit with the next question is something I feel like we've already kind of touched upon um it's it's really about nourishment but I'm mm -hmm. you know how do you feel that these more than human relationships with marine animals nourish you and in particular mm -hmm. seals and selkies which we will talk about in a bit more detail in a moment yeah well so I live in Scotland and yes. um, in Scotland you're never too far away from seals. Um, I've actually sometimes even spotted seals swimming up the River Clyde here in Glasgow. Mm. Um, so I don't know what that says about the, the um, recovery of the, of the city's river, which mm. was incredibly polluted. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've, 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 been, I've been interested in seals for a long time. <laughs> And over the years, I've gone out to to watch to watch seals on various coasts, mm. um, and um, I'm really interested in their music. So I spend time listening to their calls, which have this kind of they're really plaintive, they're haunting. They um, their 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 calls sound somewhere between singing and weeping. I've also over the years explored um, what happens when I sing in spaces near to seals and it can be quite magical because um seals really appear to respond to music they're really interested in music um and when i sing um they start to pop their wee heads out of the water to listen <laughs> and then as fast as they appear they then disappear and um on couple of occasions I've also experienced momentary dialogue or what feels like a musical dialogue where a seal or a group of seals return my call and the actual pitches are really similar and that's wow. 
that feels really special. Like we're both interested in one another mm. um, and it comes back to this, this sense of making kin, this practice of making kin. Um, mm. And um, this got me really interested in the, the folklore um, around seals, mm. um, of which there is a, a rich history in Scotland. Um, uh, selkies are, um, is another word for seals in mm-hmm. Scotland. And, and selkies are mythical creatures who shed their seal skins and then they step from the water and they can walk as humans on the land. So there are stories of selkies visiting the human domain where they often might accidentally lose their seal skin or it might be stolen by a human um, uh, and they end up trapped living as a human on the earth. Mm -hmm. But then some years later, they often find their seal skin or have it returned and then they mysteriously disappear back to the sea. Mm-hmm. Or there are stories of um, of uh, the Selkies um, who uh, might be distressed by the the hunting of seals by fishermen, and so they might might um, uh, seek revenge um, on a human seal hunter, um, capsizing a boat in mm. retribution. Um, or there are other stories. So they're kind of like warning, warning mm. um, narratives mm. about seal hunting. Mm. Or there might be um, a, a, a more benevolent selkie who might take pity on, on a fisher, fisherman lost at sea and offer <laughs> the fisherman shelter in its kingdom under the sea where there are descriptions of these selkies having cups of tea under under the <laughs> under the sea um and these stories these selkie stories were often um shaped into ballads as well mm. as kind of um spoken stories and they were they were passed on from generation to generation mm. and then there are also other traditions musical traditions that kind of they blur the line between human and seal so it's all about this kind of human seal hybridity mm. um so there's melodies that that are mimetic mimetic mm. melodies so sounds that imitate um the haunting calls of the seals um and then there are also traditional seal calling songs so i've i've been learning some of these seal calling songs over the years as well and 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 um singing <laughs> singing <laughs> on the shores of scotland uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's, um, uh, uh, nourishing because it's, um, really exploring these, uh, ways of making kin, these practices of making kin or acknowledging kin. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the whole, like I was introduced to the Selkie mythology when I was introduced to your work. Like this was, entirely, oh, wow. yeah, it was so new to me. I, I hadn't, um, come across it before. Um, yeah, but it was, it was very, very interesting. And I mean, when you were just talking to about, um, you know, seals kind of meandering into the rivers in Glasgow, like there's a, there's a rogue seal that also travels up and down the Parramatta River, um, in and around Sydney. Yeah. And and it's really funny because yeah, he's all, he's by himself. A friend was telling me about it the other day when I was actually talking about this podcast and, um, yeah. And she was saying how her parents are often out there sort of looking for him, um but yeah it's it is I mean it's really fascinating to me that there is this um I don't know that's such a such a rich and some what feels continual I mean like I said most of what you're talking to me about today is is very new for me but um you know it's such a, a long-standing history of kind of talking about this kind of seal selkie narrative within the folklore histories of um you know where you're where you're located in the world at the moment mm. but in your writing you kind of um I guess draw parallels between um you know ideas of dealing with personal grief collective grief and climate grief Mm-hmm. Um, and using these stories as a way of maybe being able to, as you said, you know, maybe grapple 
or um, you know come to terms with these big overarching realities that at times can feel all consuming and, and really difficult to kind of know I don't know how to how to move you know within within that kind of context I don't think that we can think our way out of the ecological crisis we cannot mm. think our way through um, before we can begin to think we have to find a way to meet the emotions mm. that come with um, ecological awareness like how do we meet the climate emergency um, without without um, mobilizing harmful defense mechanisms right mm. so I to share something personal a dear friend of mine um, passed away in June this year mm. and I have noticed in my grief that I have felt numb a lot mm. of the time and sometimes when I have to do something practical in my day-to-day -day, I might push aside my emotions mm. um, to continue to to live right yeah. I, I find myself numbing myself to cope mm. but I feel like this is also um, slightly harmful as well because I'm not allowing myself to fully come to terms with my friend's passing but it's made me reflect on how we do this uh, in relation to um, climate grief mm -hmm. um, in order to uh, continue in our day-to-day -day lives. I think that we, we, um, we push aside the feelings because it's just so terrifying. It's so terrifying um to know that the the climate is is changing and heating and um there's uh we're we're in a wave of mass extinction like how do we how do we come to even i mean i find it quite it's difficult to talk about right i'm noticing yeah. in myself that this yeah. is actually really hard to talk mm. about how do we process these feelings of yeah. loss of grief maybe of guilt? How do yeah. I process my feelings of guilt? How do I process my feelings of anxiety and anger mm. about what's happening? You know, how how do we meet these, these emotions of ecological awareness in the same way that how do I meet the emotions that come up from the passing of my dear friend? Um, I feel like these things are really connected um, and I guess in this work that I'm, I'm making right now, I'm, I want to engage with how I can transform my sorrow, my mm. personal sorrow, my mm. ecological sorrow through kinship, mm. through a felt connection, through thinking with, through feeling with seal. That's really, that's really the kind of, the sea of uh, emotions that I'm <laughs> swimming in right now to use the, yeah. to use the imagery. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, that deeply personal and intimate story with me here now and for our listeners. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what you're going through at the moment. It's interesting that you talk about loss because um, my partner lost his mother to COVID in May of I'm this so year. I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you. That, yeah, it's it's been wild. Um, but it's interesting that you talk about this, you know, how do you, yeah, how do you continue? How do you um, live in a way, you know, and I'm someone who's absolutely terrified of death in, in all ways, shape and form, you know, and I think it is really interesting to see how, um, how important ritual togetherness, collectivity at those times of, overwhelming grief and sorrow um, are for your own ability to be able to um, yeah I don't know accept accept the reality in a way but you're absolutely right like when you're dealing with something on such a grand scale it's so it's like dealing thinking of, for me like thinking about the solar system you know my mind just explodes because I can't possibly envision or imagine something that is just so 
so enormous, you know, that it that's yeah. exactly what you said. And my partner and I were talking about this the other day. And, and when I think of space, I'm often trying to think in numbers as a way of enabling me to conceptualize what it is that I'm trying to understand. But, you know, as a counterpoint, I find it really fascinating that you talk about, um, you know, coming to the ecological um, crisis from a place of felt experience like a motive response and connection because it's um yeah it's again it, it comes back to what we we're talking about before but it, it's something so physical and yeah and in that way perhaps maybe the only way that we can truly um I don't know yeah first acknowledge the situation that we find ourselves in but then be able to sort of imagine a a path out or forward or or whatever you you can sort of yeah I don't know but yeah yeah and um yeah how do we feel feel our way through Mm. um also I think what I'm really aware of is um how 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 grief can sometimes be a really private thing Mm. and um Mm. and that's really necessary but also what does it mean to collectively grieve as well and what uh where is the power within that if we're um if we're grieving um if we're grieving the earth i mean yeah. is that a um it's kind of a form of resistant mourning in a sense it's um there's a power within coming together mm. um in our communities to grieve absolutely and i mean i think too you know um you know, with different communities as well or different cultures, there are many, many collective grieving practices as well or even acknowledging the sort of the time that you yeah. um, mourn, you know, the, yeah. the loss or the death of, of someone close to you. Um, and so, yeah, within that, that shared experience, I think there is great power. And, um, yeah, I don't know, and, and, and wait, I guess. I mean, it's, I think... As, as you're, yeah, as you're saying, I think it's important to sort of within dealing with, yeah, the, the earth that we all sort of sit within and on, um, you need that kind of collective acknowledgement as well to sort of feel as though you are, you are a part of something and that there's capacity for it to look a little different. I don't, I don't know, but yeah, um, yeah, it's really fascinating, um, so maybe let's let's think about your new commission for the twenty third Biennale of Sydney. So, I mean, I really I really love um, this sort of foundational principle of Rivas, which is building upon what's already there. I think mm. it really pushes back against this idea of Biennales being about newness and spectacle, and mm. you know the greatest thing that you've never seen before. Um, and, and really, I guess, honouring practices and practitioners who are deeply invested and have kind of given a lot of love and labour to ideas and, um, yeah, and thought. Um, mm. So I'm curious, you know, how your new commission, I mean, I think we've kind of touched upon it throughout our conversation today, but how your new commission for the Biennale will extend upon your re- years of research with this idea of will be coming with seals and selkies. Mm-hmm. Um, but but what sort of perhaps, what is that extension? What is it that you're kind of now um, navigating through in relation to the project? Yeah, so um, I am still in the process of making this work, um, but I can share what I know just now. Um, so I know that the work is titled Seal Skin um, in the uh, sense of seals, multiple seals, apostrophe kin. So it's a little pun. I love a pun. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it will be a single channel film and sound work shot on location. And I've actually just I've just made a decision about the location um, it is. It will be shot in the the mouth of the Ethan Estuary in Aberdeenshire in Scotland, uh, where there is a large colony of about four hundred grey seals and <laughs> common seals. And um, I was there the other day, uh, watching, listening, and singing. And it's it's really magical, magical place. 
Um, and I'm going to be working with other performers, other performance makers, um, and devising a a place responsive vocal composition, which will um, explore some of these musical practices that I've discussed earlier. And I'm going to also create a movement choreography, which I think is going to center around um, a skin. Mm. So I'm, I'm, um, interested well I'm, I'm beginning to make a costume which is made from a, a sort of tubular bit of fabric um it's actually referencing um Martha Graham's iconic 1930s work Lamentation Martha Graham the choreographer um where she stretches against this fabric mm. um and um, it's just a very short piece. You can find it online if you're interested. Um, and I am working with um, with my partner's mother, who is a <laughs> who is a a, a a lead dyer at the National Theatre in London, and oh, wow. she is dyeing this fabric to look like seal skin. Wow! And um, i she sent me some samples, and it's just incredible. It's um. It really looks like seal skin. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to create a choreography that um, really explores this um, uh, shape shifting between human and seal, mm. looking at the skin as the mm. site for grief. So I've been quite interested in Judith Butler's writing around grief and loss, um, uh, grief as transformation so thinking mm. about the connections between these selkie stories and the skin as the site for transformation but then think then thinking about the skin as the site for grief so mm. there'll be this choreography somewhere in this and there will also be um uh, other performers who will embody these uh seal human hybrid characters who will um appear and disappear from the water oh, wow. and sing. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm possibly going to work with an underwater camera to also mm. create the perspective of the seal appearing and disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be a lot to, of uh, imagery around um, uh, being submerged in mm -hmm. water, but in sound and it's very, it's still in this kind of quite imagistic phase of the work, but um, yeah, it will, essentially, it will be this vocal, vocal choreographic work for film that explores alternative processes of grieving mm. through kinship, through becoming with Seal, in, mm. a, in, a, in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> I also really appreciate um your sort of very conscious word selection it's um it's such a beautiful way to talk about your practice and to kind of build this very um thorough holistic narrative to to what it is that you are doing and although you're saying that it's very much in the um I get the process of you know becoming it still just sounds so um yeah so thoughtful and and so deep deeply embedded in in you know your thinking and your um yeah, you're, you're everything really. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to move away from this word thinking now because I'm like, we're yeah. speaking so much about well, it being more than. Thinking but... with, feeling with, I think, yeah. I think, um, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yes, now I'm course. becoming aware of it. But, uh, um, yeah. But yeah, I think I mean, it's important. Like you said, I mean, what, I mean, my, my interests are, you know, within sort of, um, alternative pedagogies and how we kind of okay. share space together and that type of thing. And, um, I mean, you talk, we talk a lot about embodied learning, but of course, you know, there are these embodied practices which move between and through and, and can exist in so many different places. And I think, yeah, it's really important to kind of, um, yeah, elevate that and to kind of talk about it with equal significance and weight mm. as, as mm -hmm. a really significant form of, um, yeah, knowledge and, and shared knowledge and exchange. Yeah, there's some... Um... Absolutely. I'm really interested in tacit knowledge. So mm. these embedded embedded 
embedded embodied vernacular yes. knowledge is. <laughs> um what what can we learn through through doing um yes. through practicing um as opposed to just writing and talking it's yeah. um yeah there's so much about um these tacit forms um that we can learn from I think too they they require a willingness to be a little bit more vulnerable as well which I think is you know in spaces of risk um you know I think it, there's exciting or exciting potentialities can lie yeah I mean I'd say so I'd say that about place responsive work in general as well mm. because um every every minute working outside is different right it's yeah. not like you're working in a in a controlled theater mm. or gallery environment um so you know some days seals will come some days <laughs> seals won't come some days the 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 wind will be uh will be still some days they'll be blowing a gale so mm. um but i think the invitation to me for this work <laughs> um the work is inviting me to be present in that space mm. so um i i often think of my friend will who um he uh I've worked with him. He he's been a movement director in 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 works of old um, of mine, and he often reminds me that the work is behind you, which is a little bit a bit like what you've been talking about with rivers, mm. um, building upon mm. what's already there. Um, the trust that the work is behind me, the research is behind me, and now all I need to do is be present in that moment. Mm. And so that's what I'm going to try to do with this work. And then I imagine that there'll be uh, um, uh, a dramaturgy and narrative that evolves as 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 um, these improvisations happen within place. Yeah, I like that. That's a beautiful. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's a beautiful statement and it's, um, yeah, it holds true. I think it's like standing strong in your own knowledge system and, and your, your base and your support. Um, final question. I mean, this again is like quite, you know, big and bold, but I mean, maybe if we can just kind of ground it in sort of one key takeaway that you hope that maybe listeners tuning in today or in the future or being Ali audiences who are able to visit your work in real time may take away from their encounters with you and your work is there something if you see the seal swimming in 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 the river in in sydney <laughs> in um, river, yeah. maybe my invitation is yeah. to um explore what happens when you start to sing or start to call um yeah i think that's that, beautiful that's, a, that's my invitation to you I think that's a, a beautiful note to end on. And I, um, yeah, I hope that we have many people along the Parramatta River singing to the seal as he oh, makes his journey delightful. down. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. It's such a, Thank it was you, such Leah. a pleasure to chat with you and for being so um, generous and um, honest in, in your responses. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful that, um, yeah, that, you know, I've been able to share space with you, but that we can also kind of share that more broadly when we release our podcast. Lovely. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Being With, a Biennale of Sydney podcast. To learn more about the 23rd Biennale of Sydney, Rivas, head to biennaleofsydney.art.